Welcome to part two of our video lecture. We are working our way through some Q&A from the week four readings of COM2143 Digital Media Literacy. And we're in the middle of question and answer time with, uh, from, from and with and for, and it's really it's for everyone, Destiny Jackson. We're looking at some of her questions. And she points out uh, an excerpt from the Popular Culture uh, Introductory Perspectives text. Quote, Lip, Lipman, Lipman saw the world of commodity culture as producing pictures in our heads, implying that the mass media shaped our worldview by providing us with images of things we had not experienced before. End quote. What do you think that did for society as a whole? Well, one of the things that, uh, that this provided was it gave us collective memory in distinct ways. And this collective memory uh, is, is accompanied by the shared language of popular culture. And that's, that's really an important break, breakthrough that we should recognize collectively. It, here is that uh, popular culture is is an existing language, and it's and it's a multicultural mixed language. It's visual. It's linguistic. It it it, it encompasses many numerous signs and symbols, it's overlapping, sometimes contradictory, sometimes competing. Uh, for for space and legitimacy and or leg, legitimization, and uh, and so part of that acquisition of the language of popular culture is is the familiarity that many of these texts have. And there's a someone picked up on one of the comments Denisi makes later on in, in chapter three, where he talks about uh, how self-referential popular culture is that. Part of popular culture is that it's constantly referring to itself and talking about itself. Texts talking about other texts, uh, a term uh, we identify as intertextual or intertextuality, right? This sort of uh, referencing of, of texts uh, between one another. So it gives us, you know, popular culture gives us a kind of collective memory um, that we we share together, and then it's it itself is a language. In terms of that writing, well, in the twenty first century book, Destiny had a couple of uh, quick questions that I, that I think we could speak to a little bit. Um, quote: The mechanics of a written piece are its spelling, punctuation, capitalization, and grammar, end quote. How would picking out these key items in an article help us with finding out if an article were real or fake? And this is fantastic because we have week four emphasizes a, a, a week-long discussion on the nature and the, and the rise of what we call fake news uh, and subterms like alternative facts and so on. And so Destiny's asking how do the traditional rules of uh, writing style, grammar, punctuation, and so on help us in that mission to discern whether information we come across online is real or fake? Uh, so this is a great question. And I think an instant feedback, and this is whatever response we have here is not meant to be the complete uh, list of ways, but just a kind of pop fly response to, to your question is, let's not immediately put full trust into posts that come primarily through and on social media. Okay, social media naturally disguises grammar because it it uses cultural shorthand, right? It's just kind of like the language, uh, the the development, the evolution of texting. We we develop these shorthands, and part of what we're doing there is we are disguising gra grammatical accuracies with inaccuracies. Yes, and so there is a lot of extra decoding then that we have to start learning about and, and, and integrating and, and in order to interpret accurately. And so with, through this shorthand, sometimes what is happening is there's a process of transference. So uh, by 
everyone starting to practice more shorthand communication, it becomes normative, right? It's normalized for us. And then when it's normalized for us, we accept it as common communication. Well, then when someone goes to post, let's say, a fake news story on social media, but the tell sign is they have poor grammar, uh, bad stylistic writing, all of a sudden, audiences like users on the internet we can no longer tell the difference because we've be, we've become acclimated to how to the shorthand style of social media usage so you follow me here so then it becomes this whether it's accidental or intentional it's a manipulation of our of our slang uh, social media slang uses and shorthand and then it's easy to disguise itself as 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 regular and thus convince us of some you know falsified facts or false claims or what have you okay that's exciting that's good stuff so you want to be familiar with the credibility of the source be able to determine the credibility of the source is there an author's name listed when was it posted is there even a date when when some information was posted uh, can you can you find the digital footprint of the author of the contributor the researcher and so on and what does their background tell you about the information? Are they credible? Do they have experience in that area? Are they using sources? Do they have hyperlinks? Are the hyperlinks working? Are they broken? Are they, it, I, I came across some information when I was uh, chasing after some responses to, your, to our class's questions. And I was finding lots of old broken links. And so that sends up, you know, these, these warning signs uh, for us. So uh, be diligent in, in, in if you want to really buy into some claim of information online, then it better have uh, some, some additional information that you can hunt down to verify uh, in response. And um, there was a, there was a personal question. A lot of you threw in some um, they say personalized questions, like individual questions about your own writing experiences and style, and that's important to consider. Um, Destiny mentions, you know, when I say sometimes uh, I'm repeating sentences out loud, they sound good. Other times they don't. I'm looking, you know, essentially looking for consistency. How do how do I make it sound? Uh, good and 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 get around second guessing myself and so the, the the point of the of the question was was about is there a solution to always second guessing ourselves and it, it, the answer really does go back to well, what is our experience level uh, how much repetition have we put in over how long um, there is a certain oh I don't want to go there yet but um, there is the old Malcolm Gladwell's uh, 10,000 hour rule, which is not his own rule. He just kind of capitalized on it and became a, 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 a pseudo celebrity um, for this uh, for this idea published in this book. But this idea that 10,000 hours of experience will should elevate you to a master of whatever area of expertise you're pursuing or engaged in. And, you know. We can accept the moral of that claim in that due diligence, practice, and repetition uh, commitment uh, to that over time is going to help us improve. There's nothing wrong with second guessing yourself. Um, that's that's a good thing because. Uh, writing experiences over time have gone through many phases where. Uh, there, there is. Uh, you, you get to a point, and you think you've you've looked at it so many times, and you walk away from it, cleared your head. Maybe some time goes by, you come back and look at it, and it's like, where was that? That was there the whole time. New, mis you find new mistakes, you find new things. Um, that's why we have deadlines. We simply have deadlines help us get help us get things in on time. Um, but everything can always be re re refreshed a little bit okay so think of that as an attribute not a detriment to your writing experiences